Uh, the Milky Way, nothing like it on a summer night. Hey everybody, I'm Stargazer Mark and so glad you're with us at the American Space Museum as we share backyard astronomy with you on Stay Star Curious today. And we've got a nice little program about backyard stargazing, looking at two constellations, Sagittarius, that looks like a teapot, and Scorpius, it looks like a big old fish hook. And what I'm going to show you today are images that I took uh, the last couple nights, actually, with this camera, uh, a, a 35 millimeter camera. It's actually got a zoom lens on it. But any camera you have that will give you a time exposure of up to 30 seconds or and a high ISO speed, like around 1600 uh, is what I shot the pictures you're going to see with tonight. You can take your own astro photos and believe me when you have juxtapose a tree or something in, in the foreground you can come up with some real creative things so we're going to talk a little about that show you the fish hook in the teapot you'll not forget it when you go out in your own backyard but marty winkle my cameraman co-producer here running our stream labs uh, engineering computer booth here uh, Marty, the moon dance is going on. We've got the crescent moons drawing all eyes up. And 51 years ago, that's a half a century plus one, Apollo 15 was on the moon. And Marty, I don't think I saw anything about it over the weekend, did you? He says no. Marty, of course, we brag about him as being a national treasure who worked inside all those ascent stages of lunar module doing his lead electrical engineering work, and then he would walk around it on the descent stage. So he was inside LM-10 that's resting on the moon right now, 51 years ago with David Scott and Jim Irwin. Scott is 90 years old. Irwin passed away almost 20 years ago. He's the first moonwalker of 12, uh, the 12 moonwalkers to die. And orbiting the moon is Uncle Al Warden, and we all have a fondness. If you ever met uh, Mr. Al Warden, he passed away a year ago in March, and he is sorely missed, one of the real fun characters of the astronaut corps. That, Like I said, I had the privilege to meet him. You'll never forget him. Uh, but uh, yawn, nobody seems to care. But we're going to talk about Apollo 15 on the moon. One of the neatest locations right beside a lava rill that collapsed. Looks like a river. They popped over the three-mile-high Mount Hadley, two-mile-high Mount Hadley to land. I mean, a, a great a visual mission. And we'll share some of the highlights of that tomorrow on Stay Curious. But today we're going to get out in our backyard. I want you to get your tripod out and have your camera ready. You're going to want to focus your camera on infinity. Do things before you go outside. But if you do go outside, have a red flashlight with you. Or I put a red bulb in a lamp where I stargaze. Uh, set up my little stargazing situation. Because red light will not contract your, your pupils. All right, they will. Uh, uh, you want your pupils dilated. So what a difference it makes after sitting out, setting up for about 10 minutes. You're going to see everything in the backyard. I always say it's like jumping in your, your bed at night. You flip the, the lights off. You don't see anything. Five minutes later, everything in the room is crystal clear. So, Marty, I got a book here. You want to get a stargazing book? This is a good one. Uh, Eon Ridpath did this excellent book for the American Nature series. And I've got star charts in there. And uh, that's how you learn about what's going on in the night sky. And I want to impress upon you. You find a little window to your universe in your backyard. And the sky will pass in front of you as the earth rotates. So let's see that little window of my backyard there, Marty. I'm going to put this a little bit right here uh, behind me for a minute there. This is a window of my backyard in Port St. John's, okay, uh, Florida, just about 15 miles from our museum here. And so I took this photograph uh, yesterday during the day because the night before I took this photograph in the same scene there, or a couple nights before. There we have a clouds going through and some bright stars, all right. And the brightest star we see is about right in the middle, and that's Antares, a reddish star. But 
this is actually Scorpio, the Scorpion, the Scorpion. And when I go to this, aha, I outline the fish hook of the stars there. And it dips down into the tree into a nice little fish hook shape there. Uh, there are some treasures of the sky hidden in this picture. I'm going to show you some in Sagittarius, the teapot here in a minute. Uh, but there's a couple globular clusters and... Uh, Here's another look at Scorpio. There you see the entire, I think, think you see the fish hook there without me outlining it. I'll go back. There I outline part of it. The, the hook part of it is below into our logo there. But there you see in the sky, actually to have it show up a little better, I defocused a little bit to make the stars bigger. And there you see the, the, the three stars the middle star flanked by a star on each side. Well, first in the upper right, you see three stars above each other. That's the top of the hook or the pincers of, of the scorpion. Then you go to the left and the bright star in the middle is Antares, a red giant. If that star was put in our solar system, it would swallow up the Earth and uh, up to the orbit of uh, Mars almost. And uh, Antares, which means rival of Mars, is 330 light years away. So as you're looking at it, 1920, uh, I mean uh, 1920, uh, 2020, uh, is, is you go back 300 years is what I'm trying to say. So it'd be 1722 <clears throat> is when that star light left. And I need to get my drink over here. Always have something cool to drink with you or hot depending on the season out there stargazing so you don't get choked up like I did. Now you see the fish hook on the bottom here. How, how can I do that, Marty? I guess I can't. But you see the fish hook lifting up on the left there. Uh, there's Antares and down to the fish hook there, yes. And to the left of the hook, we're going to see some globular clusters here in just a minute. But if you're up north like Dave Stangy, you're going to barely see Scorpio clear the horizon. This was taken in Tennessee, and this other picture uh, was taken here um, in uh, Florida. And it should, uh, but it's a different time of night. It, well, give it about an hour, and then Scorpio will be much higher in the sky. But I can't see it because of the pine tree. So this is my window to the universe where I know that I can see things and not have to move my telescope around if I'm just patient and watch for it. Well, here's another picture of Scorpio. All right, very washed out because I'm on top of a mountain in Virginia and with a, a long exposure, actually this was film, uh, I got so much more of the Milky Way, all right? And what are we talking about the Milky Way? Marty and I were talking about that earlier. Here is our Milky Way galaxy edge on now, okay? As if it were a pie plate, and we're seeing it, or the, this book is edge on now, and then from above, you see the book. Well, we're looking at this from side view, and the sun is two-thirds of the way out from the center, all right? So when we're looking to the south, like we are right now in these photographs, we're looking south towards Miami, we're looking towards the center of our solar, of our, our uh, not solar system, we're looking towards the center of our Milky Way. Just like the planets orbit the sun in our solar system, our sun orbits the center of our galactic core where a black hole is, all right? And I'm going to show you a picture in Sagittarius. The archer is what he really is in, in mytholo mythological talk, uh, where the center of our galaxy is. We know exactly where it is. We can't see it because it's immersed with all kinds of clouds and stuff. So Marty, we don't see this part of the of our galaxy because it's the, the center core is like a wall prohibiting us from looking through the other side there. So we're only seeing stars very near us, okay? And when we look to the south, we see the massive star clouds of the Milky Way. Well, let's move on from my view in my backyard. And you find a place in your backyard to the south and then to the north. 
uh, we will look at the, the Northwest here um, in, a, in a little, uh, on a stay curious, star curious, uh, just like this to show you that though you don't have a full sky view, find an area that looks interesting that it blocks out some of this, the, the uh, light from the uh, light pollution. Now, I know that I'm going to lose this site here. This is, this is the same view there. All right, you can see those palm trees there in the foreground to the left. But uh, as dark as this looks to you, I might not even be able to see this in a, in a couple years when they build up a subdivision or something south of, uh, uh, south of me there. We're actually looking towards the city of Coco. So in here is Sagittarius. It looks like a teapot, all right? And there's the teapot. You've got three stars on the bottom that make the triangle for the spout, uh, four stars on the left that make the handle as I take it back and forth, and one star at the top that's the top of the, 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 the spout. And what the ancients saw was where the handle of the teapot is. They thought that was the bow of Sagittarius, and he had shot an arrow along the top of the spout, all right? And we're gonna see the name of that top star in the spout in just a minute. But uh, these are, again, all these stars are looking, are close stars to our Milky Way, in our Milky Way to our sun. And you can just barely see above the spout, all right, it looks like a little bit of a cloud there, okay? And to the lower right, right here, you see a little bright little ball of stars and one there, all right? And way up here at the top are some clouds, all right? You look at this on a monitor, you're going to see that we're looking into the center of the Milky Way. And here's another close-up of the Milky of, of uh, the teapot. And there I have outlined the teapot and a whole bunch of things that you can see uh, some are there and some aren't. At the bottom, I've got uh, uh, some M numbers. Remember the M numbers we talked about on Stay Star Curious? Charles Messier catalog, catalog the, the brightest 105 uh, faint fuzzy objects back in the 1800s be, uh, because he uh, thought they were comets, but then they didn't move. So he made a catalog of them for other comet hunters because comet hunting in the 1700s, it was like uh, you could become real famous with comets named after you. And they didn't even know what comets were, for sure. But uh, so we got three Messier numbers that we don't see. But uh, and there above the teapot, center of the galaxy. I got it marked right there. Center of the galaxy. All right. We've got one of the stars of the um, handle has an interesting name. It's called Nunki. And Nunki is uh, a blue-white star 210 light years away, and it is second magnitude. The faintest you're going to see with the naked eye is sixth magnitude, but the camera will capture a lot fainter than that when you're in a dark area. But we're limited here by an exposure of uh, 10 seconds is all at 1600 ISO, all right? And you can see the star cloud. It just looks like a faint little area in there. Uh, that is part, that is the, the center of our Milky Way galaxy. Now, I get away from uh, town there in Port St. John and get over to maybe Bull, uh, the Bull, uh, that's one of these darker areas around here, we'll go up to Mims, I'll see more of the Milky Way. This little ball over there, M12, above the, the top of the teapot spout, I've got marked there is M22, and it is 10,000 light years away. And this is a ball of stars. Here I'm going to share a photo someone took of that through a telescope. That's a ball of stars that is older than our Milky Way galaxy and orbiting us like electrons around the nucleus. All right. And there's about 150 of these balls of stars called globular clusters that are orbiting uh, our galaxy, and we see them orbiting other galaxies. It's a very much of a mystery when and how they formed. But the summer sky is filled with them. 
Uh, there's a lot of globular clusters, we call them, because they're globular. Here's an open cluster, nothing globular about that. That is the, that is the place in the lower right-hand corner right here, uh, M7, is an open cluster, very bright. That is in the tail of Scorpio, all right? And there, through a, a, a telescope, you wouldn't see the individual stars, but it would look like a big cotton ball. In photography, you see the individual stars. And then, but you would see individual stars even with binoculars with this uh, object, M7, that's low the horizon. Again, right there's the ball of stars I just showed you. So, give you an idea that there's some hidden gems up there. See the Lagoon Nebula and the Triffid Nebula? Well, if I was in even a reasonably darker site, uh, like up in MIMS, it's, it's pretty dark away from all the shopping centers and and, uh, but still, if you look looking south over them, uh, you see the Lagoon Nebula and the Triffid Nebula, and this is what they look like with just a, like a 200 millimeter lens guided on a telescope. This isn't really even through a telescope. It's a, a, a 200, maybe 250. And you see the Lagoon Nebula is named that because it looked like it had a lagoon in the middle of it. In the Triffid Nebula for three parts, because it was broken up into three parts. And these, you cannot see the colors even through a telescope, but photography reveals them. And they are quite easy to see there in that photograph. There's little smudges in my light polluted backyard. But when I put my 8-inch reflecting telescope on them, it looks really cool. Uh, yeah, I can see the faint fuzziness. It looks like a lagoon. Uh, nebula like uh, we've shown here in the Triffid, I can see uh, the three different parts. These are areas where stars are being born in the Milky Way. Okay, these are uh, areas that are, uh, oh, 20, 100 times bigger than our Milky Way, uh, than our solar system. Uh, a thousand times bigger than our solar system, probably Lagoon Nebula is. And the Lagoon Nebula is towards us in the center of the Milky Way. And it is uh, about 5,000 light years away. So the light we're seeing, all right, came to us uh, when the, the pyramids weren't even built. Uh, or depending on who you, who you talk to there. But uh, yeah, the Triffid Nebula, uh, it is believed to uh, 50 stars are going to come out of that blue and red beautiful thing there so uh, so going to end it here we're showing you some pictures of the milky way that i've taken just with the camera set up like this again all right a couple tips is you want a sturdy tripod you want to put the camera on manual setting in a high ISO, like 1600 or 2000, all right? Uh, uh, if you get up higher, that's fine. You won't need as long of an exposure. Uh, but you can test it and see your pictures on the back, what they look like, and know, because you can oversaturate a picture and expose it too long by, you might not, like I can only take 10 seconds on, on these photos I was showing you tonight, today. If I took much longer, they would wash out completely, all right? It would just start going to white as it's, it's uh, capturing all of the, not just light pollution from the city lights and so forth, but that light bouncing off of moisture in the sky, all right? And actually we have a Sahara desert dust in the air over Florida right now that uh, I see some astrophotographers show that is kind of compromise some of their images by making things a little bit on the bluish side as this dust is absorbing blue light. So uh, you can go outside, get a good tripod. Uh, your camera uh, has an adapter on it that, that will attach to your tripod, okay? Uh, part of what they call it a quick release. Don't do automatic focus. Focus on infinity, all right? Uh, or look through it in focus, infinity might be just a hair off. You want on manual or put on S for shutter. All right, if you have S for shutter, uh, I think that the lens aperture will open up uh, automatically. But you manual, put on manual, then put it on start like 10 seconds. 
and then your f-stop your aperture opening your a or your f-stop you want it to be wide open f4 or 5 something like that whatever is the lowest number it'll give you put it on there so and then a very key is put your camera on self timer your self timer is a little dial all right like a clock dial and you'll be amazed when you find this if you haven't been using it why do you want your self timer because it'll count down put it on five seconds and one two we push it in one two three four five in fact i'll uh don't uh, i think my i don't know how many, uh there you hear the that's counting down to and now it's taking a probably a 10 second exposure because i had this set up for last night it eliminates any camera shake all right cameras are very sensitive any shaking in there is going to make your star images a little bit blurry or bigger so you use that to eliminate any camera shake that your finger mashing down the trigger may have put into that yes your finger triggering the shutter can put enough movement in that to make your picture blurred and that's a great tip to know anyway for vacations or whatever don't delete anything look at what you got in your camera in the back all right uh and uh don't delete anything because you never know what it looks like sure enough that's just a big old white on the back there because i took a 10 second exposure in, in here so uh so i hope that you've learned a little bit of uh some astrophotography you're an astrophotographer when you take a picture like this up on white top mountain that is the light pollution of the city of johnson city below uh actually it's bristol tennessee uh, uh virginia below it there uh hope that robert law had a good uh, uh week with the scouts marty he was doing something with the scouts over the weekend christopher mick i'll bet you'll go out next clear night and take some milky way photos uh, Melissa Pope, thank you for watching at the Space Coast Office of Tourism. Long Giassani is watching. Tom Salentano, thank you for watching, sir. William Whiting and Burke Stevens are on board to do a little bit of Star Curious here on Stay Curious. And hello there, Carlton Bailey. Hope you're doing well and uh, getting ready for the next launch, no doubt. Well, photographing the Milky Way here again is what we're photographing. Is there's the sun. We're looking to the south. In the summertime, we're looking into the center of our galaxy. When I talk about the spring and, and, and winter, we're actually looking out away from the center of our galaxy, okay? Of course, the Milky Way is above us. I didn't show any pictures of the Milky Way above us. That's where it's really spectacular because I just focus in that little area of my backyard and I could sit there for a couple hours as Scorpio and, and, and Sagittarius move by as the Earth turns and bag those messy objects off my list and make sketches if I want, or more ambitious, take some photographs through a telescope. Looking down on top of our Milky Way, you're saying, wow, it's not a pinwheel uh, uh, spiral. No, it's actually what's called a bog spiral. You got these, it's sort of like a bar of stars that have been moved away out by gravity. And we've got two gigantic arms with a couple offshoots off of it. And we are in what's called the Perseus arm of the, of the galaxy. And we whip around the galaxy once every 300 million years, all right? So in the 14 billion years of our existence, all right, we've made... 300 million, that's 3 times 14, or 50, we've made over 40 laps around our Milky Way galaxy. Now, has it changed over those 14 billion years? You, or, you bet. I mean, 4 billion years, not 14. We're, the universe is 14 billion years old. We're 4 billion years old, or let's say 5, uh, 4 point something. So uh, we've only gone around about 12 times, once every 300 million years. So maybe there's something that when we're on one side of the galaxy, dinosaurs become extinct. And another side of the galaxy, a lot of meteors hit the Earth and in our solar system. So this is stuff we'll never know because it's just time is so long and drawn out, right? But this is what we look like, folks, believe it or not. We're an insignificant star 
in a oasis of a hundred to two hundred billion stars and you know what marty most all the stars we see close to the sun have other planets going around them so if i say there's 200 billion stars in our galaxy there's got to be 200 billion times four or five that planets in our in our, our, our galaxy and as the webb telescope after the hubble telescope showed us there are billions and billions of galaxies well a couple more pretty pictures None gets prettier than stargazing in the Milky Way out at uh, the Texas Star Party in the uh, uh, chin of West Texas out there near the Mexico border at uh, Big Bend is the area this is. That's the finest shot of the Milky Way I've ever taken. And the, tri the teapot of Sagittarius is buried in there, okay? It's about right in the middle. We're looking at the middle of the galaxy. There is how it looks maybe from your subdivision i outlined the teapot there the milky way going overhead but unfortunately i wish we could see it like this from your backyard but you got to travel on top of a mountain or to a desert uh remote area away from city lights still we love the milky way all of its tales of mystery and imagination hope that you go out and get some starlight from the milky way this week the moon won't interfere too much brightness washing out the Milky Way until next week when we're moving to full phase. First quarter is this Friday, so next weekend we'll be having the full moon and you won't see any part of the Milky Way. But then a week later, as the moon moves into the uh, 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 late evening sky and morning sky with all that moonshine, all right, you'll definitely see the Milky Way pop up. So you've got a couple opportunities in uh, August, September, and October to see the beautiful Milky Way go out. Maybe try your hand a little astrophotography. Send me a picture if you want, and we'll post it here on Starry Stay Curious. So, Marty, thank you for everything. Thank you all for watching out there today. And uh, we are so appreciative uh, here at our American Space Museum that you found us and, and want to enjoy our programs. Tomorrow, we will talk about 51 years ago and Apollo 15, an amazing lunar mission. You won't want to miss some, uh, always try to find unusual photos. And I've got a few racked up already. So until tomorrow in the next Stay Curious, I'm Mark Marquette saying we will see you again to bridge the space between us.